The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, aviation, film, business, literature, and religion. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they'd been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Dr. Olivia Hooker, a Tulsa survivor from the riots in 1921, and Reggie Turner, filmmaker who's produced Before They Die, about this unknown story in black history. Reggie and Dr. Hooker, glad to have you with us today on African American Legends. Thank you. Thank good you. To be you here. are an African American legend. Glad to be here. <laughs> Now, Reggie, as a filmmaker, and I understand as an attorney, how did you get into this uh, forgotten story? Well, actually, for me, it was not even a forgotten story. It was an unknown story. I stumbled upon this as a result of a relationship, business, personal, professional, with Professor Charles Ogletree from Harvard University Law School, a Stanford classmate of mine and my best friend. He went to Tulsa to... Uh, receive an award and was taken into an anteroom to meet some VIPs. The VIPs turned out to be the living survivors of the Tulsa race riot. Professor Ogletree was unaware of the story, called me on the cell phone and asked me what I knew. I was unaware. I went online in an effort to help him and could not find any information on the internet. At that point, we both decided to delve into this and to find out why it was two young black Americans who had degrees in history from Stanford University did not know about the Tulsa race riot of 1921. Mm -hmm. He was hired as their attorney because no attorneys in the state of Oklahoma would take their case. Take their case for what? Take their case for reparations. Mm -hmm. Take their case for justice. They wanted to make sure that their story was told. They never set out for the purpose of give us money, but they really wanted to make sure that this story, which had been hidden from American history and Americans for more than 80 years, would see the light of day and that they would have their opportunity to explain and help America to explore this tragic time in American history. Now, this riot occurred in a prosperous African-American community in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I think it was called the Greenwood Community. Is that right, Dr. Hooker? Yes, that's correct. Now, tell us a little about the Greenwood Community before the riots. Well, the Greenwood Community was a prosperous business section in which all the entrepreneurs uh, worked together and so it was practically self-sufficient. We didn't have to go downtown for anything, at, except the bank. We didn't have a bank. And the people of Greenwood were inclined to stick together. I mean, they'd go an extra mile to buy something in my dad's clothing store or to buy something in the man's grocery store. They were, they were very, very loyal to the entrepreneurs that were out there, and the ministers in the churches emphasized that. Now, know. how did the entrepreneurs get their money in the first place? This is oil country. Did they get the money from oil? Not all of them. I'm sure some of them were in Oklahoma, you know, for the land rush and maybe had a stake in that, but most of them had learned something somewhere else and moved to Tulsa, like we, mm. we moved to Tulsa from Muskogee, Oklahoma. And uh, I think it, through thrift and foresight was what they had most of, not money, but they helped each other too. They had a business league and they helped each other. So there weren't many people uh, that actually had oil land. There were few who had uh, oil land. Well, I understand you are now 94 years old. I understand I be. that mm -hmm. uh, you lived in a house that was worth $10,000, which at that time was a lot of money. Yes. Now, that means that somebody up there was doing pretty well. <laughs> well, yes, uh, they, they were thrifty and, you know, and thoughtful. And then there were people, you know, who had some uh, inheritance money, but th there weren't, the most of them didn't speak about inheritance. They mm -hmm. spoke about hard work. Uh -huh. 
Well, I think uh, President-elect Obama would like to talk about that again. He talks about hard work for everybody, and particularly now that African Americans have a uh, mm -hmm. symbol in the president, that might make more and more African Americans uh, work hard. I now, hope so. Now, Reggie, tell us about the circumstances of the riot. Well, what Dr. Hooker is alluding to, as well as in your question, uh, Greenwood, the Greenwood section of Tulsa was the most successful African American community in the United States. Outside of Washington, D.C., where I grew up. Well, <laughs> we, far be it for me to argue with a Washingtonian. <laughs> the dollar turned over 36 times in, in, in Tulsa. Uh, we actually were successful because of segregation. Mm -hmm. uh, it forced us to do business mm -hmm. with each other, and consequently, there was an accumulation of wealth because we supported each other and each other's enterprises. Well, actually, that is really true about black communities in places like Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Richmond, Virginia, Baltimore, Philadelphia. Yes. Uh, in Washington, D.C., we had the Industrial Savings Bank, yes. one of the largest, right, at that time, the largest black bank. So that I agree that I had heard that the Tulsa people were really very rich people, <laughs> but... Uh, well, they, they were called they, Black Wall Street. They were called Black Wall Street. Yes. <laughs> now, were they Black Wall Street because they invested in Wall Street or because they spread the money among themselves? Well, Dr. Du Bois, on a visit to Tulsa, looked and saw all the thriving black businesses there and used it in terms of referencing New York where they were the model of business success and operations were and said this is the equivalent mm -hmm. of what I've seen in New York. This is our black Wall mm -hmm. Street. Now, the circumstances of the riot itself, apparently all of this affluence caused some whites not to be very happy about it. Dr. Hooker, what was the relationship with whites at that time? Well, at that time, of course, I was six years old, mm -hmm. and we had very few contacts with people who were not black. And um, I think very few people, other than working, you know, if they, they may have an employer, but most people didn't, didn't uh, flock into and out of uh, each other's homes and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And the only people who were not black that I had seen a lot of were salesmen who came to sell things to my father. Mm -hmm. And if you're selling for Florsheim and Kuppenheimer, you bring presents to the children <laughs> and you listen to my sister play the piano. And I thought that's the kind of personality that all whites had mm -hmm. until they came through the backyard with torches and burned my doll clothes before they even came in the house. It, Tell us about what led to that riot. Well, on the morning of May 31st, there was an incident in an elevator. A uh, white elevator operator was accused, a black shoeshine man was accused of assaulting a white elevator operator. Uh, he ran from the, the scene, uh, later turned himself in to a uh, local pastor who brought him into the sheriff who promised to protect the young man. They had him in protective custody and over the course of that day the newspapers started publishing inflammatory articles and pronouncing that there was going to be a lynching later that night. Black World War I veterans who had recently returned and were living in Tulsa decided to come to the courthouse to help protect this young man and to see that at least he got his day in court as opposed to being lynched. They were initially dismissed by the sheriff who told them that they had enough uh, people on his staff to protect them and to go home. At that time, there was about a crowd estimated at about a thousand outside of the courthouse. Later that afternoon, especially after the afternoon paper published the article about the lynching, the crowd swelled to over 5,000. At that point, the black servicemen and a group, another contingent of men, a total of about 75 black men, came to the courthouse to once again offer their assistance and support. The sheriff told them that he had made provisions to protect the young man and asked them to leave. As they left the building, one of the black men was approached by one of the white mob who said, what are you doing with that gun? And he said, I'm using it if I have to. They tried to take the weapon from him, the, wa the weapon fired, and at that point, the worst race riot in American history began. Eighteen hours later, the entire community of 10,000, 
uh, black folks, over 35 square blocks of the community had been burned, looted, and bombed, and more than 300 people have been documented to have been killed. But we believe that number is still substantially higher than that. Now, Dr. Hooker, as you say, you were six years old at that time. Yes. What is your first recollection of this riot? Well, I was at home, of course, and my mother had been away to get my sister from boarding school, and when she she was cooking breakfast is when I found out about anything happening, and I thought it was hail because I heard it hitting the house, blip, 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 blip. And I said to my mother, she had put us under the big old table, to, you know, because she knew what was happening, but I didn't. So she took me to the window and had me peer through the blinds, and she pointed up on the top of the hill, because we were the highest house on the hill of Independence Avenue, and she said, you see that thing up there? That's a machine gun. You see the American flag on top of it. That means your country is shooting at you. And this was absolutely astonishing to a child who had been brought up to say all the preamble to the Constitution and, and uh, you know, to recite the liberty and justice for all. It was a real shock to me. I think the other children in the family, other than the baby, knew about prejudice. But at that point, I'd been into in schools that were of all of our hue and fine teachers, and they never told us about hate and prejudice and separation, that sort of thing. So it was quite a shock to me to see them come in with those lighted torches and set my grandmother's bed on fire and, you know, break up the records. Did they bother you? We, Mama had us under the table, and she told us to stay there. And so they did not touch us. They simply took what was useful or what they thought was valuable. They took my mother's luggage, was still packed from picking up my sister at boarding school, and they took, they broke up the records. But they were selective. and. Uh, when anyone had written anything at all about the riot, they implied they were just all ignorant marauders who didn't know any better. But they were not. They were. They knew what they were doing. And as I have said before, they broke up the records, but for for the phonograph. But they didn't. They broke all the Caruso records, but they did not break the old rugged cross. So they were being mm -hmm. selective and trying to give us a message that, you know, you're, not, you're getting out of your place or something. Now, this is a community, 10,000 people. The riot occurred. Uh, how did it get stopped? Did federal troops stop it? Did the governor stop it? How did it get stopped? Well, it, it, it's interesting. It was stopped because essentially there was nothing left to burn. There were no more people to shoot. Uh, in a mass exodus, folks grabbed what they could and began mostly by traveling by foot. The few who had automobiles or wagons loaded them and proceeded out of town as quickly as possible. Uh, Where did they go? To all parts of Oklahoma. There, we have stories of people who traveled as many as 100 miles in the course of two or three days, but for the vast majority, they walked and never returned. They just continued moving on. Uh, a community that went from 10,000 to over the next year or two probably grew back to 1,200, 2,000 people. They were then housed in tents. So a lot of their belongings they had no place for, even if they were able to recover them. And a lot of their belongings were found to be in the hands of white families. Uh, a lot of them were being stored at the police station and folks could go down and identify their property if they could find it. They spent a lot of time amazing stories of people walking down the street and seeing their handmade clothes now being worn by white people who had stolen their property from their houses. Well, what did the law, law enforcement people do with those folks that had that uh, things that they had uh, confiscated? Well, two things in answering the original question was what did law enforcement do? Law enforcement joined in. 
the sheriff began to swear in a number of those folks who were in the crowd of marauders out in front of the police station and deputized them and authorized them to get weapons. They opened up the police armory and, and armed them. They went into pawn shops and gave them weapons and ammunition and gun, shop, and gun shops to give them guns and ammunition and turned them loose on the crowd. Uh, they called in the National Guard. The National Guard arrived the next day and instead of controlling the crowd, the National Guard actually joined in in chasing black folks and arresting them and shooting them. Eventually, they corralled as many of the black men as they could and took them to the ballpark and kept them in what essentially was an internment camp and held them there until someone white who would come and identify them, a white employer would say, this person works for me, and vouch for them, and then they were allowed to be released uh, back into their custody. But the majority of black folks left Tulsa and just kept running. Now, this obviously should have been a national story. Yes. It should have been a national response. What was the national response? Well, the national response was actually very muted because the town fathers made a point of shutting down the telegraph, the telephone systems. Mm -hmm. They did not want the story to get out. Uh, to the credit of Walter White, the famous uh, black journalist, who, because of his hue, actually could pass as white. Walter White was in town, and he wrote very stinging, very revealing stories about what he had seen, what he'd been exposed to, because white folks talked to him and gave him entree and passage because they thought he was white. So a number of his stories got out into the black press, and the black press made sure that the story was told. In fact, even the New York Times, who got copies of some of those stories, was one of the two national publications who wrote anything about the riot. But from that point forward, the city fathers in Tulsa denied the story and, and put the kibosh on it. So national journalists did not continue to follow and look for it because there was a question as to whether it had even happened. Well, when did the story really come out? Uh, agreed they were suppressing it, agreed the residents had been displaced. When did the story come out? This was 80-some years ago. Was it 70 years ago, 60 years ago? Maybe well, you can tell us, Dr. Uh, uh, there was a woman whose last name was Parrish who wrote a book right away in 1921, mm -hmm. a, a young, and her uncle, who had a printing press, printed the book so it was privately distributed. But that only circulated probably among black churches and so forth. And then the Literary Digest magazine was the only uh, really well-established uh, or, uh, media organization that actually put it in the paper and showed the rubble and how everything w was destroyed. But other uh, newspapers didn't for years and years and years. Uh, how many years? When did it begin to be known? Well, when really? the story really started to get some national attention is as a result of legislation that was brought by a state legislator at that time, uh, Don Ross, who's lost a number of his family members in the riot. And the story was told to him. As he became a state legislator, he proceeded uh, pro progressed to get the legislature to uh, structure a committee to investigate the Tulsa race riot uh, in 1998. At that point, they could set up a, a, a Tulsa race riot commission, which included the great historian Dr. John Hope Franklin and several other historians who spent four years studying the files and records of the riot. And in 2001, they published the commission report for the state of Oklahoma on the Tulsa race riot. Now, it seems to me that certainly in the 30s and 40s, maybe 50s, the black residents of Tulsa should have been keeping the story alive. Were they doing much in Tulsa at that time? Well, they talked more ab among themselves about they what they wanted was restitution. They, they felt that uh, their insurance companies should have been forced to pay. Mm -hmm. My father sued his company for seven years, and they finally threw it out of court. But they didn't want to pay one penny of the insurance to all the people who had insurance. And uh, they pictured us as the uh, 
perpetrators of the crimes rather than as the victims, mm -hmm. and that way blaming so, the victim. Yeah, we wiggled out of paying, and uh, now that was, in your film before they die. You wanted to, you and Professor Ogletree wanted to get this on the record so that people would understand it. Now, what do you plan to do in terms of distributing this film? Well, currently we are on a national tour where we're taking the survivors and the film and doing screenings throughout How the country. How many survivors are they, by the way? Well, when we started the case uh, back in 2001, we had 151 living survivors. Mm -hmm. Today I have 67. Mm -hmm. So, and you're trying to get reparations through the courts as well. Well, we've we've gone into federal court, with federal appellate court. We were denied certiorari in 2006 at the United States Supreme Court. Uh, we've gone into the international court and recently received a ruling from them in our favor, forcing the United States to respond to the complaint about uh, human rights violations. So we're proceeding with that, but we've moved into Congress. We have a bill pending uh, before the House Judiciary Committee where Dr. Hooker, Dr. John mm -hmm. Hope Franklin, and Professor Ogletree testified. And we have legislation that we won't get done this year, but certainly in the new administration, we're quite hopeful that we will get this legislation passed, which will lead to compensation to the survivors and their descendants. What's families. the nature of the compensation you're asking? Well, w what we've done is basically taken a projection from what the Japanese victims of internment mm -hmm. received mm -hmm. back in 84, which was $20,000. So we've put a cap basically saying $50,000 per living survivor. Mm -hmm. And we've not determined a figure for the descendants because as you go through the process of trying to define compensation and you look at loss, the estimated value of damage that was done at that time is somewhere between two and a half million and four million dollars in 1921 dollars, mm -hmm. which works out based on some of the economists who we've had working on it to somewhere between 29 and 40 million dollars today. Uh, that will be part of the battle within in the committees and hearings is to determine what is the final amount. You know, this is really historic now that we've elected the first African American president elect. Oh, yes. And now many of us in the African American community expect some of the wrongs of the past to be righted. Yes. Dr. Hooker, what is your opinion? What do you want as a result of this story about the, the film, the suit? What do you want? Well, I, one, I'd like to see restitution in some form for people who had been thrifty and saved and so forth. And they do have. Uh, they have a monument there in the Greenwood section mm -hmm. that has, lists the names and the amounts that the people uh, remembered that they lost. So that, I think, would just be justice to, to re restore. I would also like for people to realize that America has a lot of work to do in order for us to be in peace and harmony. and. I think it'll happen because our population actually has changed mm -hmm. so much and we are so much more diversified in this whole country. Mm -hmm. So we have to be peaceable <laughs> and we have to be caring about everybody. Now, Reggie, you're an attorney, you're a filmmaker. You were witnessing history being made right before your very eyes, you helping to make it. What do you want to have? happen as a result of your effort on before they die. Well, I, I certainly agree with Dr. Hooker that compensation is not is due to these folks. We have amazing documentation of what families had, what they owned, what properties they owned, uh, bank account records. We've done an amazing amount of research and turned up documents so that they can, uh, an assessment of value is, is pretty clear. Uh, so I'd like to see compensation for them. Secondly, and w one of the biggest issues is that because the story has been hidden for so long, it hasn't been taught in American schools. It's not in American history books. Our work over the last five years has done a lot to expose the story, so people yes, are beginning is. to find much more information about it available, and our film certainly provides them with a, mm -hmm. a complete record of not only the case, uh, for the reparations for them, but about the riot itself. Now, in revealing the story, do you want white people to have a sense of guilt? Do you want black people to have a sense of entitlement because of what was done to them? W what do you want to happen as you actually increase the awareness of the story in our society? I want 
America to recognize its past mm -hmm. and acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. We do not hold white folks responsible mm -hmm. for this event. It didn't happen. The folks who perpetrated the crimes are no longer with yeah. us. But we should not deny our history. Mm -hmm. We are constantly told by the Jewish community and reminded about the Holocaust and the atrocities that took place there. We teach the Holocaust in our schools. Every place that I show the film, there's always a member of the Jewish community who stands up and sides with us and says, you all have to teach this story just like we teach the story of the Holocaust. America cannot be allowed to hide from this story. We must acknowledge our past, make amends, and move forward. It's not about guilt. It's about right. It's about justice. And Dr. Hooker, with this historic occasion of an African-American president-elect, how do you feel in terms of all of this background of what happened to you, what happened to blacks throughout the South and so on? How do you feel about it? Well, I've been asked that many times because when I went to Jerusalem and my colleagues in the conference said, you didn't go in the Holocaust Museum. I said, I don't need to go in there because it happened to me at home. Mm -hmm. But I did go to see all the trees that were planted in honor of the Dutch people who sheltered folk mm -hmm. from the Nazis. I thought that was important to see the memorial to the people who stood up and took a chance, of, took a risk mm -hmm. to help. And I think that's something we got to stress and our children have to grow up knowing that sometimes you have to reach out in order to preserve goodness, and we're not talking enough about conscience, so but we need to build more. Well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Hooker and Reggie Turner for bringing this episode of African American life into the light, into the sunlight, and I certainly appreciate Dr. Hooker's good words about looking at the future. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having thank us. Thank you for having us.